All right, Adam, you there? I am. And uh, are you joined with, by Greg? I am joined by Greg Cost. Greg, welcome to Oxide and Friends. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Adam, pleasure to meet you. Yeah. You, you, you know, you've got a good like radio voice, Greg. Thank you. Uh, I think so. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I don't, I, I know I'm, I'm sounding surprised here. I don't mean to sound surprised. Someone said that a, a couple weeks ago about me. I, I'd not heard that before. But All right, we're going to take it as a compliment. You know, the, 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 your career as a, as a podcaster <laughs> could be launched right here on Oxide and Friends. This could be where it all begins. Right, where you're discovered. This is where you're discovered. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, Adam, I was at Red Hat Summit a uh, week before last. And right. I, I, you're like, wait a minute, are we talking, what, where are we right now? No, we're, the, we're going to get to the on topic, uh, was on at Red Hat Summit and was really great. How many folks were coming up to me having listened, being big listeners to the podcast. You gotta, that, that's great to hear. That's, that's yeah, really fun. Yeah. In fact, someone said, you know, I love the podcast, even the baseball one. And I'm like, you, you don't have to phrase it that way. You don't have, you don't have to say even the baseball one. You can just say, I love all of the podcasts in its totality. You don't need to take our weirdest episode. So I am, I am looking forward to someone in the future being like, I loved the podcast, even the crazy biology book I loved. So I, um, I'll try to keep it second weird. <laughs> try, try. Yeah, I think you'd be, we, you know, we had, uh, Greg, we had the, the, the co-founders of the Oakland Ballers on here. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was pretty, it was great. I thought it was, I thought it was great, but some people thought it was, uh, weird, but it was not weird. I thought it was terrific. So that, that was a lot of fun. Um, but the, so the origin of this one, and Greg, I was explaining this to you a little bit before we got started is that we, um, have, um, through kind of the life of Oxide and Friends, which started out as a Twitter space and then moved to Discord, uh, we had some people who were who wanted to like, let's go read a book together. Let's get kind of folks that are in the community, let's read a book together. And I thought that was exciting. Um, people may never ask that again. We'll see. <laughs> we're going to see. We're going to see. This may be, we may be one and done on this one. People may be like, okay, well, we asked that and we saw what happened. <laughs> asked so an answer, never, right. Gotcha. Asked an answer, never done that again. I think they're like, no, I would think I was thinking more like a, like a kind of a book in the computer industry or a history of the computer industry or something that's a little more on brand for you two. Adam and I have both uh, read a lot of books on, on the industry and on computing and so on. Um, but I wanted to get a little further afield and I wanted to do something that would be a bit more of a challenge that we could all kind of motivate one another to get through um, and something that would be uh, kind of out of our wheelhouse. So the, the folks that are certainly Adam and me, but a lot of the folks that are kind of the, the oxide demographic uh, are all in computing. Right, so we're a, a lot of computer scientists, a lot of software engineers, and I'm sure we've got—I know we've got some folks that are also uh, biologists as well. But sure. but but they are first and foremost, we're really computer scientists, and uh, really, uh, I, I saw that that um, my friend in particular, um, Gaurav Venkataraman, had. And I, have you met Gaurav, Adam? I don't. I don't no, know I haven't. Met. Oh man, Gaurav's amazing. Um, so I met Grov years ago at, um, when he and I were in an event together and really fascinating technologist, um, out of the UK. And I saw him tweet out a, a review of this book. Uh, I think it was Dennis Noble's review of the book, but I still can't read because it's in nature behind a paywall. So I, I've got, for all I know, that <laughs> review of the book is like, no, this is like, this is a total stinker. Don't read it. But the, <laughs> um, he had in particular, Grov was tweeting that like, this is a really interesting book and this is kind of capturing um, a lot of the uh, pulling together a bunch of different ideas and new ideas in biology. So that's kind of the backstory here for how life works by Phil Ball. And then Greg, I, I kind of sweet talked to you into joining us. I'm very, thank you very much. Oh, for, you're for, welcome. For, oh, I, I'm a card carrying biologist and love explaining and not to be presumptuous for a second. And, uh, oh, it was a, it was a fun read and, forward to talking about. So Greg, why don't you give us a sense of a kind of folks a sense of your background? Cause I know this is obviously much of this is obviously not new for you. This is what you've been doing for a living. Sure, um, sure. but could you describe a little bit kind of, uh, your background, how you got into, uh, into microbiology and, and when kind of what you're, what you're doing now? Uh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, so I have, uh, started out with a bachelor's in chemistry and then, uh, decided I like the squishy part of chemistry more. And so, uh, ended up when I was still a teenager, I was starting to work in a biology lab, founded it. It was really the problems I cared about, understanding how the chemistry of life worked, right? And so I uh, ended up going to grad school in that. Um, yep. 
so you were as a teenager working in a lab and like uh, yeah. hands on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Make, making DNA and all making that. DNA. Yeah. Okay. And that it's pretty cool. You get your little white fluffy. What? That's awesome. It's pretty cool. And I, and how did you get associated with a lab? And was it? it uh, there were uh, at my chemistry department at my university. There were um, a, a couple other people who were also biochemically in, you know, oriented, and um, they were talking about the role. And I said, "That sounds like something I might be interested in." Um, and I, you know, I want to explore there. And they said, "Well, we actually have a job for uh, as a lab aide." That was my first job. Uh, I basically, you know, those petri plates that you grow bacterial colonies on the, the round disc things with agar. I, I made those for everybody, and I. I autoclave pipette tips and repaired tubes and like all the, the grunt work. Right. right. But um, it's a great place to get your start, right? Well, totally. And I assume that, I mean, for at least for me, coming up in computer science, like the lab work was so such an important part of my own education. Of like, you know, you kind of get the, okay, I get how the system is supposed to work, but it's like actually the lab work of making the thing is like it, really connecting for me. I, it's I've it's totally be, different, right? Yeah, yeah. You, 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 Biology and I mean you can't see molecules with your eyes, right? So it's a very like as with most a lot of things in science, it's very theoretical. You have to use your imagination, right? But actually doing it is a completely different thing than thinking about it. And so, yeah, definitely had a great experience um, as an undergrad. I uh, went to grad school, uh, ended up doing a postdoc, moved here to the Bay Area. Uh, and so, and then when are you kind of coming up in terms of, so you're doing the, the, these kind of DNA based experiments, sure. when is this kind of, cause I think that, sure, sure, sure. that, I mean, so much of the backdrop of this book is kind of the, the human genome project and the, kind of the hubris that may have come around at HEP. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I started in, uh, 1993, okay. so 30 years ago, to, uh, it's been a while. Uh, that's, that's when I had that first lab aid job. I went to grad school in, uh, uh, 95 to 2001. Okay, so right when the Human yeah. Genome Project is like, oh, I go Absolutely. bullseye for this. Like literally every day, or maybe it was every week, they would dump another 10 megabytes of DNA sequence onto the public server wow. for everyone to see. It was like the first time ever that it was revealed, right? It was a pretty amazing time. And, um, you know, actually at, at the time I decided I, um, it, one thing that people found when they looked at the genetic sequence, and this has been known before the sequencing, but um, but there are a lot of transposons, like a lot of these repetitive DNA elements in the genome. Right. And I kind of made the offbeat choice that I wanted to study everything that wasn't a gene, really. <laughs> and so, and this was like the, because the, the, I don't think this term merits a mention in Ball's book, but I definitely remember the, the term junk DNA. Uh, yeah. It yeah. being one. And it feels like in in reading this book, I'm like, that term is not aging well. It's a little pejorative. <laughs> it feels very pejorative. You know, I mean, it's um in some ways it's not terribly wrong. Um, but I mean you could probably delete a lot of it and we'd all be fine. We'd never be the wiser, right? But you know, I think evolution doesn't waste anything. And so if you have this DNA sitting around and and they're it, it finds a function yeah. over time just because, uh, yeah, that's, that's how uh, things work. So you got into these transposons and understanding their mechanism in terms of like what they were and what was kind of known at the time about transposons? Uh, so they were discovered um, probably in the 40s by a woman named Barbara McClintock, right? And uh, that's how you see in an era of maize corn, right? The, the kernels are all different colors. Some of them have stripes. It's act, that coloration pattern is actually um, a result of transposition. That's actually something mentioned in the book, right? Um, and that, I think those are the first transposons that were discovered. Um, uh, and then, you know, people um, people just looking at, like, melting and annealing of DNA strands realized that there were some weird things going on and it couldn't all be random and that there were repeats. And so that, that, was, that work was done in the 70s. The first DNA sequencing is probably the 80s really the late 70s, early 80s. And um, these things, were they're extremely common. And so they were discovered relatively early on. Um, probably about, the one I studied is probably about 17, 18% of the total human genome by sequence. It is, it is 17 or 18%. Yeah, and it, it's probably huh. actually caused the synthesis of about 45%, close to 50% of our genome. Wow. So this is significant. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, the, the, the bizarre thing is at the time, uh, I was the most academic possible thing you could imagine studying, right? 
Uh, but now, actually, the company I work at, which is called Addition Therapeutics, we're actually using very related retrotransposons in order to try to do gene, gene engineering and try to, to cure human disease. I should say, by the way, that I'm, I'm here in my personal capacity, not in my employer. But uh, yeah. Oh, I was going to reveal that Addition Therapeutics <laughs> is our first sponsor of Oxide and Friends. I mean, not, <laughs> sorry. Okay, I've got some misunderstandings here about the... Uh, um, it, okay, and when you say reverse transposons, what's the yeah. reverse sure, in there? Sure, sure. Um, so some, um, some, some, some transposons are what are called DNA transposons, and that's sort of the, you will, the normal type of transposon. So a, d a segment of DNA will make a protein. That protein will cut out that DNA and then plop it down somewhere else. Um, the type of transposon... Hey, but these are not genes, right? They, 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 we... uh... Oh, sorry. Is everything well, complicated? People call them elements because okay. they have their own agenda. But <laughs> strictly speaking, they are they are they are have all the things that genes have. Right. So uh, I think of them as genes, but a very odd class of. Okay. Um, they are they're they're not commonly thought of as benefiting us. Let's put it that way. So they're sort of like. Interlopers. That's, that's that's the language that's used to describe them. Sometimes. It feels like a, only a small upgrade from junk, frankly. <laughs> it's like, hey, good news. You're no longer junk. You're an yeah. interloper. Yeah, it's yeah. like, hey, listen, pal. Like, yeah. I uh, feels like a mo. Okay, so yeah. and actually, in, in uh, recent discoveries, like a lot of these transposons um, may actually have a role in aging and disease. Like, they end up causing a uh, a, a sterile inflammation. Like, our, our, our immune system gets kind of turned up and up and up as we age. Um, Nothing good comes from that. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. 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 Anyway, sorry to answer your question. The um, retro transposons are um, kind of the a, a weird category in that um, they make an RNA, like coming from the DNA, and that's something that uh, like like in a normal gene, right? Instead of that RNA uh, being so sorry, the RNA is turned into a protein in the same as the the normal situation. But then um, what's and then what's replicated actually doesn't stem from the DNA being replicated, but rather the RNA. Um, gets is the substrate for the replication. So there's a oh, reverse transcriptase that turns that RNA back into DNA, and in the process, actually integrates it into. The okay, it has to do with just the mechanism. The, the mechanism. Okay, so the reverse bit is the, the is is just a yeah. an indicator of the mechanism. Okay, um, so okay, so given the backdrop of all that, and so you're obviously. You're a practitioner. You're you've been doing this for thirty years. You've been very much involved in what we know from a science perspective and how we can use that to benefit humanity. Um, so maybe that's a good segue to the actual to the book. Yeah, the actual book. Yeah, yeah, the actual book. So, um, with, all right. So, what did you make of the book? Yeah, great question. So, I had the, I because of that background, I think I have a perspective on the book right um a lot of the biology wasn't new to me um and so i had to think about you know i think that i was called upon to take the perspective of someone who didn't actually already know the some of the details going in right uh, which of course most people don't right and i think the the book is definitely written from the perspective of someone who you know has a good a college level education in biology and you know, you learn that there's DNA, the DNA makes RNA, the RNA makes proteins, proteins catalyze chemical reactions, and then all that complicated chemistry, like you might see these big wall charts, cycles, cycles drawn, right. right? All that stuff happens in some big symphony and, you know. Life. Life. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. <laughs> uh, you know, I think a lot is, is, is detailed in the book. Um, a lot of what has been discovered in let's, let's say that's a like, that's a very i would say late 50s 60s model right right and a lot of well science has progressed since then right and so i think a lot of what's discovered is um that you know it's a little bit more complicated than that right yeah. there are uh, notably i think alternate forms of information that are inherited not just dna yeah that's a very has been i'd say a, a very surprising discovery um it's um, that was the big one for me. I is uh, the, the big thing I think is notable for for, for an outside person, right? I think, you know, I think he makes the point very very clearly in the book. Like, if if you just had the genome and you put it in a yeah. bunch of soup, you wouldn't suddenly have life, right? Life is more than the, the 
the DNA, right? So it has to exist in a context of information and organization that allows an energy that allows the plans in that DNA to be brought forth, right? And um, so, you know, the book is goes through many different interesting examples of how things are a little bit more counterintuitive um, than we might expect. You know, so I have some more more critical thoughts. You're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely want to hear those. I think yeah. that the yeah. I mean, I I think. I mean, part of what is so interesting about this book is, I mean, this book ultimately is about metaphor to me, and about the you know the the effectiveness of metaphor, and especially the metaphor of computation. Uh, and you know, do we? And certainly, I mean, God, we've. I feel well. Ball does it repeatedly in the book himself, even though he tries, I think, not to about using a it's so tempting to use a program text as a metaphor for dna and vice versa that like oh this is like a stored program computer and like look i've got this instruction sequence and the instruction sequence happens to be nucleotide base pairs and it's just like software and i i think it's like i i that metaphor is super tempting and understandable and also really misleading in a bunch of very kind of deep ways because it's the i mean my like one of my major takeaways of this again not this is like in the not deep thought department but the the machines that we engineer are absolutely nothing like biological life they are at the, yeah the, 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 that they are at the opposite end of every conceivable spectrum and, you know, I loved that, you know, uh, Mike Olson, Adam, sent me a line that I loved was as he was getting into the book. And he's like, these are like programs that only operate on side effects. Hmm. So, interesting. which I thought was a really interesting way for a software engineer to think about it. So, yeah. like, we are spoiled stupid in software because the instructions that a computer executes are very deterministic. And, and they were written by a human who... who they are written by a human assumption yeah, that uh, makes sense. A hundred percent. And we love to like treat them as like biological because they're, they represent complexity that we don't understand and, and so on. And we love to kind of complain about the level of complexity and like, look, like for like decent reason, it is, it is remarkably complicated that you've got, you know, got a laptop here that is executing billions of instructions per second, but ultimately are all synthetic. But, it would be actually a, a a pretty complicated exercise to describe every single instruction that this thing is executing as part of being in this discord. And it's all adding up to like, but as complicated as that is, it is like nothing, absolutely nothing. I was just like, I don't, I don't know. You must have felt the same way. I'm just like where you're just like getting just the humility that you feel on the complexity of life. It's just oh, yeah. not. Uh, it, the, the, again, it's like the, and it's a, the kind of the open question is like, does the metaphor serve us well or not? And you're talking about fishing in the pool of mechanical metaphor to explain yes. biology. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Agreed. It, it, it's a, it's a weird misfit for sure. And I think I was steeped still in the, like the late nineties human genome pro project hype uh, and had not even kind of, uh, take enough biology to understand the distinction, the the fact that the genotype had many different phenotypes that it could produce. And I mean, I think sort of vaguely aware of that, but not the degree to which that was the case, that even things that we view as uh, complications or, or errors in uh, development, yeah, that's just like one of the potential expressions and uncommon, but not necessarily something that, um, something that literally is written in the DNA, in the genome. I, I so, think everything um, is... Sorry. No, please, go ahead, Greg. No, I was going to say, I think, um, you know, the, the instructions are probabilistic, right? And yeah. like, that's, that's how things work, especially at the molecular level, right? And the machines are all the machines, but they're, they have to operate via very different rules, and they have to account for noise and all sorts of stochastic effects. And, I mean... Yeah, absolutely. De developmental biology is it's it's a, a landscape, and like if things are guided towards one outcome, but uh, you know, they, they, obviously, it's not it's not a sure thing, right? Um, yeah. I mean, you, we've all seen identical twins in our lifetime, right? uh, totally. And 
I don't necessarily look. They're not exactly identical. The same, they're right? not identical. No, right, no. Yeah. We and we had identi we've got identical twins live across the street. Okay. And when they were much younger, I could not tell them apart. Yeah. And then as time went on, you're like, they are, and one is an inch taller than the other, yeah. you know? And I, I did, I, you know, I, I mean, I feel like my, my brain blew up many times in this book. Um, and again, I'm, this is all common knowledge for you, Greg, but the, uh, one of the lines early was that, uh, you know, of the single nucleotide polymorph polymorphism SNPs so seen in the human population, 62% are associated with height. <laughs> and you're like, okay, okay. So, okay. Height is more complicated, uh, even height, which is like, <laughs> right. which like pretty clearly is like, it, it, it just feels like everything was complicated. I, I think height is something that is very easy to measure, but it's not something that <laughs> the organism really cares about, right? It's like, yeah, every, yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. You know? like we're not programmed to grow to a certain height. We're programmed to like metabolize nutrients. And if you do that a little bit better then yeah, really, you know, it's interesting. You'll just grow a little bit more. Right. Right. It's like, um, you know, you've been on, you've been in these old houses from like 300 years ago and the doorways are about five feet tall. Right. And it's because people who are very poorly nourished back then. Right? right. And so they were just shorter. So you've got to sell a bunch and of things the in same height. DNA. Right. Right. But, um, and I think what goes into the genetics of height is like the same thing that goes into, it's like a million different pathways, right? Like anything that makes the cell grow happy, <laughs> or our bodies grow and be happy will make you like fractionally taller, right? Right. And so it's not, um, you know, everyone can stand up against the wall at the doctor's office and like, ooh, I'm growing, right? Well, as you say, it's very easy to measure. Yeah. So it's very kind of like attempting to oversimplify. It. Yeah, yeah. It, it, there's not a gene for height, though. There's not a gene for height. Yeah, no. Yeah, as you say, it's like a whole bunch of things yeah. that are, yeah, that, that that's that's really interesting. Um, I mean, I also feel that like the, another thing that was super surprising to me in the book well actually I, do i want to talk about the things that troll i guess we'll talk about the things that troll us in a little bit i was all i also well, found myself trolled at least once in the book yes i'm you know sure I, i'm sure i i i, I can oh. i can i'm sure i can guess it but uh, before you oh. depart <laughs> yeah. you know you, yeah, yeah. you were talking about um about metaphor and about you know, sort of the humbling nature of this to computer science i don't I, maybe this is too far giving uh, us too much uh, of a pat on the back but so some of these emergent behaviors, you know, you think about the complex um, uh, you know, systems that we create. And I think that you look at, look at some of the performance we're doing around like, uh, you know, our storage facility, for example. I don't know that we could just read the code and infer the properties of it. And obviously that's like a that's true. Yeah, for sure. billion, trillion times simpler than what we're looking at in terms of gene expression or whatever. But, but still like... Uh, I, I think um, it, it was interesting to me reading it, seeing that in any complex system, you have a lot of these same properties where it's not necessarily predictable just from the raw material, even when that raw material is as simple as things that we've crafted with our own two hands. Totally. And actually, Adam, you know, another thing that I felt myself reflecting on is in terms of like, you got this computation metaphor that breaks down for all these reasons. Uh, but you know the other thing we actually spend a lot of time thinking about and talking about here is uh, the way we organize people and organizations. Hmm. And I'm like, actually, a better metaphor, you know, hmm. for like, like what it, I mean, we because we, we've talked about like the culture of oxide, you know, and some of the things that we do as a as a as a company culture, which is something we think about and have thought about a lot of, but has a bunch of these like amorphous, ambiguous kind of qualities to it, where it's not completely deterministic, and yet it also is like. Also, ultimately, like we have height as an organization. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, they, yeah. I, I don't know, Adam, I don't know if the same thought had occurred to you though. I'm like, that's actually in some ways a, it's a, it's easier for me because I have a really hard time with the ambiguity. Um, we are, again, spoiled in computer science where these things ultimately execute a single instruction at a time. And we, the systems we make are really brittle. Like you can't mm -hmm. just... You know, Adam, were you in the office when we had what is a typical dumbass idea of corrupting program text and seeing how many instructions we can corrupt <laughs> before the kernel panics? Do you, do you, do you, do you, <laughs> this is like a classic dumbass lunch discussion that we had. Or like, so you, you, we, we've got a running operating system, right? Yeah, yeah. And so there are a bunch of instructions. And it's like, let's start corrupting instructions. How long does it last? And do you remember this, Adam? <laughs> Uh, not that specific one. I did once like replace all locks with no ops because ha ha, how long would that last? And it was like, not long. 
not long. Not ago. long. Yeah, so that's another good, actually, it's an even better example. So the the uh, we synchronize different threads of control operating often on different CPU elements in a system operating on a shared memory. And the way you make you the way we reason about them is we say, no, 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 no. Only one of you can access this at a time. Like you have the lock. And so what Adam, the experiment he's talking about is like, I'm gonna just gonna like make those no operations. So like you want the lock? Everyone wins. Everyone gets everyone the lock. wins. <laughs> Everyone's a winner. And the system does not last long. Yeah. Like the system blows up really quickly. The great thing about biology is that every organism mm -hmm. out there has been challenged in a in a reasonably similar way, right? We've had you're thrown into a weird environment, right? And um, you know, a million generations ago, your whatever a bacterium ancestor had the same experience, right? And so it was selected yeah. to function robustly in the absence of that information or a particular nutrient, right? And so a lot of, I think a, a, one of my favorite parts of the book was when he talks about the, um, the robustness of life to challenge or to insult, right? It takes a lot to push an organism or a cell in a particular direction because it, it kind of like knows what it wants to be. And then it, it you know, it, have, it has to, it takes a little bit of a, a shove, like a multiple po pokes in the right direction. So, is, so what did you, it, it's li life, if anything, is not fragile. Right. It's not fragile. And I, so this gets to, again, what was a mind blowing point for me about the purpose of life being this kind of information preservation. I, I, like, I am so grateful to be a eukaryote. <laughs> After, you, you know what I mean? Like, I'm the only one that's like, I think I've been taking just like, like he makes the point of like, so sorry, why do you think like eukaryotes? Like, oh, we should all be eukaryotes. Someone want to explain all of like the single cell life around here? You know what I mean? It's just like, oh, multi-cell, multi-cellular life. Like, oh yeah, you're so awesome. Like, why is there so many singles? And you realize like, wait a minute, we don't have a right to exist. How did we, how, how did we kind of come out of the muck? How did we come out of like, why are we not all in thermodynamic equilibrium? And I gotta say like the point that like really blew my brain up and Adam, I'd be curious to know what your take of on this was like the definition of life as systems that are out of thermodynamic equilibrium. Yeah, sort of like entropy defying uh, or entropy, like yes. cre uh, creation of organization as like uh, in, in defiance of the second law of thermodynamics, yeah. Did that like I that blew my brain up? Yeah, so I, oh, I totally. Like, put down the book, like, put down the uh, book, take a, you know, things kind of close my eyes right. for a minute. Yeah. I'm daddy's gonna go back to thermodynamic equilibrium now because, <laughs> um, yeah, what was your take on that? Greg? No, I, I, um, I, so I read that book that's referenced, What is Life by Erwin Schrodinger, yeah, about 20 years ago or so, and um, yeah, it's the same thing. I was like. Like, oh my God, that makes so much sense, right? It's like a key part of life is avoiding entropy. Avoiding entropy. Localized, the localized avoidance of entropy, right? Like creating order and really a lot of what life is, is information. Yes. Like you could yes. be something yeah. living in a blender and then at the end, at the end, it's all the molecules are still there. Yeah. Yeah. And right. then the preservation of information. The preservation right? of information. Yeah. 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 And because even in his point, even not... From within the individual, we're, we're you know will decay away, but just generationally, uh, again, kind of mind blown. This is where I was like lying down in the fetal position and weeping. I feel <laughs> is the the, 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 the whole well, the, this whole like act of super efficient information preservation that like we have preserved this information crazily energy with crazy energy efficiency. And like too often we obsess about the energy efficiency of like the computation of the brain, which is like amazing, especially when you compare it to, again, what I, I posit at the opposite end of every conceivable spectrum, these synthetic computing systems that we've developed that are ridiculously inefficient and I, I consume way more power. I mean, I, and I'm sure you've had this moment too in Oxide where we, you know, we think so much about the thermal design point of everything. And then you're like, wait a minute, my brain is like 20 watts. Yeah. How's my brain doing? Like, like, I know. What the hell? And like, you know I what? turned hamburgers into like thoughts. Like, that's weird. Into thoughts, at, like, with so little energy. That's right. So, efficient. like, I'm not, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm water cooled, I guess. But other than that, like, I, you, you know, I didn't, like, that was really, and so this idea of information preservation as being very, very, very core to life was very eye-opening for me and, and 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 thinking of like dna not merely as like you know 
the answer to all that ails us, which is kind of the the human genome project kind of zeitgeist, but more the like, no, no, this is what's preserving. All of this information is preserved in here, and you've got a whole bunch of stuff in here. And I'd be curious to know what your take is on this in terms of like the, 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 how the thinking on evolution uh, and kind of this the, the, the neo-Darwinism and kind of how that's being augmented and extended and kind of rethought. Uh, if at all. Yeah, it's, uh, and I th- this is a point where I thought the book was maybe a little bit contradictory. Okay, uh, yeah. And I started to have some difficulty with it. And then I read the epilogue, and he sort of walked some of it back, maybe. Um, but yeah, certainly um, a theme for him in the book is that DNA is not the blueprint for um, for life, right? right. And um, and then he's he, that, it gets to the end, and, and says, oh, well, it's not... Um, I actually have I opened the book to this page. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I knew it would come up. <laughs> so it's far from being some new paradigm that threatens Darwinism. Uh, it's rather a glorious extension of it. Um, and that's what I kind of agree with, right? And so I thought yeah, right. sometimes exactly. in the in the, the the main text of the book, things are a little bit overstated and maybe a little bit strident. But um, at the end, I, I thought, well, it all he he kind of softened it right, and I thought that was correct. And um, look, I'm a big Richard Dawkins fan. <laughs> oh, <interesting. laughs> so okay, yeah. I have my my bias coming in, but um, uh, I think it, it's a, it's a bit like saying, um, you know, uh, well, Newtonian physics versus quantum physics. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. yeah Something that might be um, um, familiar to a tech audience, right? You know, like. Quantum physics isn't wrong. It's just right in a special case. Right. right? And so right. quantum mechanics or whatever is not, doesn't, okay, you, you could see it as supplanting it, but truly it extends it. It's extends it. Yeah, 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 right. To, to build right. upon it, right? Right. Um, and so I thought, um, I thought that was really how I view a lot, maybe most of the examples that were cited in the book, right? Um, you know, I guess um, I kept saying that it's not a blueprint, not a blueprint. And I, I guess I thought a recent experience I had where I had a contractor at my house, right? And um, I gave him a drawing for, I was having some steps redone, fairly minor thing. And I gave him a drawing for the steps. And I said, okay, here's what I want. Like, and I walked him through it. And I'm like, does this make sense to you? It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, I went away for a weekend and the guy's working to come back. And steps are great, but they're not what was in the blueprint. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> and yeah. I know you remodeled your house, Brian. Maybe you had a similar plan, similar experience. But um, so I, I guess I, I would say that DNA is kind of the blueprint, but like, there's also nature's contractor that gets in the middle. <laughs> 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 and so, right. Like you might, it, it, you, it might want to do something, but, uh, what actually gets made, what actually comes out the end, the phenotype if you yeah. will, is, uh, often not, it bears some resemblance to the intent, but yeah, it, the environment comes in, uh, uh, you know, other, other organisms come in. Uh, random fluctuation happens, and uh, you some organisms get more or less lucky with how their cells happen to divide, right? Right. Um, so, um, re- yeah, reality and noise, for example, another concept in the book, always interceding. Right? When I thought it was interesting, and at one point I asked you about, you know, the 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 term genome clearly became popularized. And it feels to me like some academics realizing that, like, okay, we need to end things in ohm. Yeah. If we want, like, that's this is where the grant money, the grant gold is is with the ohms. <laughs> uh, and so we've got the proteome, and then we've got the interactome. And it feels like then, and I asked you to, like, are there other ohms? And, like, you rattled off, like, 15 yeah, yeah. other ohms. It, 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 I guess what, what does it mean? It means, like, a comprehensive and definitive addition to the edifice of, bi- of biologi- biological understanding, right? It's like, that's right. what people mean when they say that, right? But uh, I guess, but, um, and yeah, I'm sure it was good. It's a, it is a trendy verbiage, I would say, especially maybe like a year ago. The transcriptome. Transcriptome, yeah. yeah. The, the, the epigenome, the microbiome, obviously, we know that one. The immunome. The other thing, uh, the other thing I don't think I really appreciated and it makes me want to write, go read a, a book about the, dedicated to the immune system in particular. But the immune system is kind of like, we get a lot going on. The immune system is like kind of, uh, it, it, we have a complicated relationship with the immune system. Is that a fair statement? It, it, the immune system has to make a lot of value judgments. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, uh, it being wrong is not good. Yeah. And um, so it... Uh, it has a lot of double checks and triple checks 
and um, parts of it, and then other parts of it kind of shoot first and ask questions later, right? Right. Um, they, it's broken down typically into the innate immune system, which is the uh, sort of like really active defense that sort of um, does that shooting first and asking later, and then uh, the adaptive immune system, which if there was B and T cell responses. Yeah, right. There was a great line about the immune system that I that I wanted to share. It was that the immune system has so many different components doing so many things that it is, in the words of science writer Ed Young, where intuition goes to die. <laughs> immunology, <laughs> Young says, confuses even biology professors who aren't immunologists. And then the parenthetical is, I suspect that is a little too generous to immunologists. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, interesting. That was just delightful, like in terms of the expression of complexity. Yeah, uh, I, I remember reading, that was a good one. You know, I, yeah. I, it was one of uh, my favorite topics when I was undergrad. Was immunology. the immunology, and, yeah. Uh, I thought I was pretty good at immunology. And then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, maybe several years ago, I worked on an immunology-related project. I'm reading, starting to read papers in the field again. What I don't remember what, any of this. Yeah, what happened? Right? And, uh, and finally, I figured it out because most of it was discovered after I'd last studied immunology. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that wow. was only 10 or 15 years. Um, it, uh, it's, it's remarkably complex system. I'll tell you what, though, it, there's a lot of observation bias in anything we do, right? Yeah. I think um, a lot is known about the immune system precisely because you can take a blood draw and get the cells. Right. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there are similar complexity in our liver or gallbladder or pancreas, whatever. It's just that it's a lot more difficult to understand the, uh, to, to really access the cells and to have the biology. So the immune system is something where a lot of details are worked out, but it's also, it, it's, uh, you can slice the, slice the onion even thinner and thinner and thinner. And like, like how many, quite, a, a, a great example is how many immune cell types are there? And, you know, they, these are often looked at by the expression of cell surface markers, because you can have an antibody that will bind to that marker, and you can use an experiment called, uh, do, do, use a machine called a flow cytometer to uh, really subdivide all these classes of, of immune cells. And, like, the more you look, the more types there are. And it's wow. really... Um, so even just figuring out... It's, 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 in, it's, it's just dense. Uh, you know, there was a, there was, a, somewhere in the book, there was a map of, like, I think a transcriptomic profile of different cell types, and um, one of the points was that they're not separate islands, right? There were like linkages between them with cells that yeah. were almost an immune cell or, or almost a, a hepatocyte or something, right? And um, yeah, I just get the feeling that there's a lot of that going on in general in the body, but also especially in the immune because uh, sometimes the cells switch what they do. Like the, you, can, you can be a, a pro-inflammatory a, a pro cell or a, a de-inflammatory cell, if you will. I'm just based on the context, and so huh. it's. I, I, I'll I'll won't bore you with it. No, that's but, wild. Uh, I mean, but it, it it also must be it makes it very difficult to study. I mean, this is not a deep thought, <laughs> yeah. but it's just like, I mean, I'm kind of amazed that with all of the complexity. I mean, you're talking about like you know you're discovering you're studying immunology as an undergrad, and you're like, all right, like I think I understand this stuff. I just feel like you'd get your ass handed to you all the time by how complicated this stuff is. And then I'm just amazed you don't just like walk away and like, I'm going to go like be a farmer. I'm going to go, like, I'm actually going to be the contractor that goes, but <laughs> yeah. steps in because like, I just can't, like, this is giving me such a, uh, that there's so much that I thought I knew yeah. that is actually way more complicated. Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, you learn humility quickly. You want to, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, it, you know, like I said, another thing that was brought up in the book, I think the quote from the editor, biology editor of nature, like the, the in biology, the answer is always yes. And <laughs> yeah, right. That's, that's immunology is a great example of that. Oh, is there a immune cell that does this? Uh, oh, yes, uh, but but only when X, Y, and Z are are present, right? And um, yeah, look, it it's daunting. Um, and I'm sure again, I'm sure it's the same in other fields. We just probably haven't appreciated it yet. Um, yeah, I think it's worse in biology. No, no. So I meant I meant in other uh, subfields. Oh, subfields you know? biology. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah. I just yeah. think I think you guys can like, you guys can pretty much lower the complexity over uh, basically yeah. anyone, as far as I'm concerned. Well, like, really, what's going? How, how does life work? It's it's the world's biggest Rube or most complex Rube Goldberg machine, right? Where it, it, the organization is not intuitive. It's crazy. Well, and so the other thing that that kind of blew my brain is the idea when uh, of 
Metazoans. I mean, also like like glad to be a karaoke, glad to be a Metazoan. Like nice breakthrough there. But the but evolving evolvability was a really interesting idea that like it seems like I mean there's some really interesting action that happened what what is it we're talking hundreds of billions of years ago right i mean we're talking yeah. where we've got the, the the rise of karyotes the rise of and we it feels like i mean that that origin i mean there's a lot that like all of a sudden got locked in where it could lock in a bunch of these yeah, I, I think he quotes the biologist mark kirshner who's a really famous guy um on this topic and he's and it makes that what well, his statement made a lot of sense to me like what you get when you become a multicellular organism, or you get you get you gain complexity and the ability to respond in smarter ways, is thing. But what you lose is a fast generation time. Right. So your evolutionary rate just slows slows way, way down. down. And right. so you can't count on the fact that you're going to be able to like spawn out, and you have fewer offspring, obviously, right? Especially um, and uh, humans, other primates. You can't. You you you. You'd be brutal if you were so rigid. Right. You have to be a little bit more um, flexible in terms of how things work, right? Because otherwise you would never produce a baby, right? Right. Um, I mean, look, I think the most highly evolved organisms on the planet are viruses, followed yeah. closely by bacteria. And it's not because... Are we, do we even... Are we even on the podium as humans? No, no, no. no, 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 no. Okay. I mean, no. He's like... Yeah. No, sorry. That's, that's just measured purely by the number of generations they've gone through. Yeah. I mean, um, there was another quote in the book. It said, uh, some, some biologist said, um, I would be proud to be on the committee that designed the E. coli genome, but I would not be proud to be on the committee that designed the human genome. <laughs> and that is, that is like the truest statement ever, right? <laughs> right. Um, right. And, right. So and because I, of the efficiency of it, because it was like there, there's so, so, much, so, so much purity in, in the former and so much noise in the latter. Listen, e. Yeah. e. coli is like the fourth of genomes. You know, the sorry, I'm making. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going to the fourth being a computer programming language, very okay. a, a famously simple computer programming language. So actually, the the stack based language. Actually, another question I've got for you uh, on that note, because I think one of the things that Paul talks about is you know, we've kind of had this idea that like if we can just study, if we completely understand E. coli, like we've got it all nailed, and it's like, well, maybe not. And like, what's good for the E. coli is not yeah. good for the elephant. Is kind of yeah. a line that he had quite a bit. I mean, what, yeah, yeah, what, what yeah. do you what do you make of that? Yeah, sorry. Can, can I can I just yeah, finish please. one other thing, Chris? Um, you know, one thing I think is really a little bit inspiring, actually, about just looking at the E. coli genome is that the more evolution has had time to work on something, the more sense it makes. The more it looks huh. like something that was actually intelligently designed. Yeah, interesting. Right? And so I think it's it's kind of. Uh, it's really comforting to me to know that we, with our brains, when we design things, we're designing things that kind of look like a highly evolved system just by thinking about it, right? And so I I think we're on the right track as <laughs> we design things, right? Because, yeah. Like, um, you know, we haven't, I think we don't understand the E. coli genome, of course, but like it, it, it does kind of make sense as you look at it. Like genes that are similar have similar functions are grouped together and they're regulated together and it's it's very efficiently organized, right? And it's it's stripped down, and it's fairly, um, it really compacted. Very few of these big transposons getting in the way of everything, and none of these introns sitting in the middle of genes for some reason, right? It's um, it's extremely efficiently or evolved. And I think when we design something, we design something that kind of like has the same principles. So, right. Interesting. Yeah. But much simpler. And so this yeah, is, a, yeah. I mean, to your, I guess, making the kind of the, the, the same point here about like, you know, why multicellular life, why multicellular life then? I mean, multicellular life is kind of like a bit of a mixed bag that you get the complexity, yeah, but you lose some of the simplicity. I mean, yeah. you get the power. I mean, I, I, I guess that's tautological, but. You know, I think even when you have uh, a bacterium, right, living in the soil, sure, its its unit of inheritance is itself, right, and so it's selfish in that regard. But bacteria don't necessarily live by themselves in the soil, right? I mean, they're nestled up against other bacteria. I mean, they're probably nestled up against their brothers and sisters, right, from previous generations. So if you think about a colony on a on a, on a petri plate of bacteria, right? Sure, they're all unicellular, but is that really a unicellular organism? It's not, not uh, really yeah, an organism, but I mean, the cells know that they're on the edge. They know they're at the bottom. They have less oxygen. 
greater exposure to an antibiotic in the clade, right? So, they, um, you know, I think it's, it's probably not too far from that to something like a slime mold where you have all these different cells that are together, but then some of the cells turn into the, the spore forming body. And that's how really the inheritance, inherited state, right? Um, because, because if you can guarantee that the cell next to you is actually genetically identical to you, it doesn't really matter to that gene if you're the cell that's transmitting the information or if it's the, your, your neighbor. Right. Um, that's, uh, that's my, my Dawkins plug there. <laughs> that's, yeah. how, that's how you would think of the situation, right? And so I think, um, it's like, I, I think even some microorganisms that we conventionally think of as unicellular probably have characteristics that are reminiscent of a multicellular, oh, multicellular organism. organism. Interesting. Because you can't avoid interacting with other organisms, right? Right. Just the question is, is it, is it the same genome as you it, that you have, or is it uh, a different one? Yes, yeah, Paul talked about bacteri bacterium that you know acted differently in the presence of other bacterium of the same sort, where they would kind of flip between uh, kind of lone wolf mode and collective mode in terms of sharing information about the gradient of nutrients and things like that. I mean, right along the lines of what you're describing. Yeah, yeah, there's this whole phenomenon called quorum sensing, where like, they kind of make, a, they change their behavior and they make kind of a group decision. It's, uh, I wild. thought about studying it for a while. Actually. Yeah, that's really interesting. Well, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how much, I mean, another kind of line that, that blew my brain a little bit was, and again, I'm sure this is something that is well known to folks in the field, but that cancer is a disease of organization, not a disease of cells, I thought was really interesting. Um, the... Uh, and I really enjoyed um, the uh, Mukherjee's Emperor of Maladies um, and just, I mean, how it, it feels, I mean, cancer is so fundamental to the way the cell is operating. Um, it feels, I mean, is it fair, to, I mean, this may be, uh, it feels like until we got cancer completely licked, there's a lot we don't understand. Yeah, no, it's, it's um, I think one of the discoveries in the past years has been most um most uh, provocative to me is really that even in cancers that are of a specific type, they're not all the same. Right. right. Yeah. Cancer is defined as much by the molecular nature of the mutations in the cancer and not just by the cell type that happened to originally. Um, this is, I honestly, this is where I disagreed a little bit with, yeah, uh, with the book. With Philip Ball. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I do think a lot of work has been done on, again, understanding how our normal cells evolve at the DNA level in order to uh, replicate in a way that's dysregulated. And, you know, it, no, no doubt, it's an, cancer isn't, it is not a single cell phenomenon, it's an organismal phenomenon, right? A tumor is not a single cell, but the changes that go, uh, in, that, that enable a normal cell to turn into a pathological state are, are very clearly genetic changes. Oftentimes they involve loss of different parts of the chromosome, amplification of other parts of a chromosome, and of course, specific mutations in, in, um, in particular genes that are beneficial to, um, beneficial to the tumor, right? It's like a perfect example of natural selection. Unfortunately, it's taking place in our bodies, in each one of us every day, right? We have cells that become cancerous, our immune system, again, making those value judgments, right. comes yeah, along yeah, yeah. and kills them off. Yeah. Um, and, um, but you know, some it, it sometimes the, they'll they slip through, right? And what did you think about his his comment of the uh, to develop in the tumors is one of the particular hazards of pluripotent stem cells? Um, it might be pronouncing the word pluripotent. I'm sorry, what's that? Pluripotent. Am I pronouncing yeah, pluripotent. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like, this is. One of the things we've learned in doing a podcast is that I pronounce many things <laughs> incorrectly. <laughs> And I'm trying to get out in front of like the next like thing that I pronounce incorrectly. But but uh, pluripotent is not a word that comes up very frequently in computer science, okay. but it comes up yeah, a lot in biology. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and I mean, what did you what did you make of of that line? I mean, because I thought that was that was interesting. That the that basically the, the this is kind of part of part of the cost of having pluripotent stem cells is that like we love these stem cells. Because they have such fecund versatility, yeah. But then this also sows the seeds for this versatility gone 
the well, mock. Well, you, you need you need your stem cells. You want right. them. Or you want them around, right? For right. example, in the Im- immune uh, lineage, there are what are called hematopoietic stem cells, and um, there aren't too many of them in the body. Um, but and they they divide very seldomly. Huh. So once every six months in your bone marrow, with where these cells live. Really? Wow. Um, but then the the cell that it divides into, it, one one goes back to make that stem cell. The other cell very quickly like proliferates into what I call a progenitor cell, and it makes all the cells of the immune system on, and the, erith, uh, the erythroid system, thyroid system. And so you really want them around, right? You would you would quickly have anemia and immunological failure if those stem cells weren't there, right? But um, yeah, by the fact that they can make everything, um, sometimes they they make a mistake and they do make everything in situations where you wouldn't want. So maintaining that, having that capacity is an important part of maintaining our body, repairing right. our body. But um, yeah, it's it's like any it's like any tool it can be used for good or evil, right? And uh, you know, body tries to keep it under wraps, but sometimes things break, the genes break, and uh, also slip through. Well, so the, I, I thought this was another kind of interesting theme about like you have these things that that where we are just understanding some of these effects and then realizing that like actually the effect is also really important for – has given us a lot. And so one of those for me was prions. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I so, cause this kind of caused me to like reflect back as a bystander to biology. You know, so what are some of the things that have – and certainly the um, BSE – and yeah. there was this idea that if you had had beef in the UK in, you know, whatever, 1984, that you were basically going to die of CJD. And there was a real hysteria for, I, I would say, a somewhat prolonged period of time. I mean, Bridget, because Bridget had been in the UK, my wife had been in the, in the UK for those years. She couldn't donate blood until like yeah. last year yeah. because they're just like, look, we just, we're not, we just don't know. We're not, you know, if you've been in the UK in these kind of these years in the 80s, you're not going to be able to donate blood outside the UK. Um, the, and, but then that didn't really, that didn't manifest. It wasn't as bad as people thought, but. Yeah. I mean, it was like, it like by, by like several orders of magnitude, right? I mean, there was a, th- there's a kind of a thinking that it was going to be like millions of people would die of, of CJD. I, I don't remember the original estimate. It probably ended up being hundreds though. Right. It was hundreds. Right, right, right. And, and kind of, and, um, but I, the, it, one of the interesting lines in there was that the misfolding pathology of prion proteins is the price paid for the benefits of disorder. Disorganized, disordered proteins can increase the complexity and versatility of our regulated, uh, regulatory networks, but at the cost of increased risk of toxic aggregates formed by misfolding proteins. I mean, I thought that was kind of... Oh, absolutely. And yeah, interesting. Like, prions are... Uh, it, it, it was a hypothesis that was not readily accepted, right? As you can well imagine, right? Because the hypothesis that like a misfolded protein is going to induce a yeah, misfolded exactly. protein, exactly. yeah, 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 exactly. And um, and even more than that, they, especially in microorganisms, it's been shown that they can actually transmit genetic information that way. Crazy, right? Because yeah. Hey, look, Nature doesn't <laughs> Nature care. Anything. Nature doesn't care. Nature doesn't care. Right? care what's in the textbook, yeah. right? <laughs> right? Right, right, right. So, right, right. you know, right. If, if this protein state, I mean, it's information like any other protein state. It's just right. one that's particularly self-propagating, right? Right. And so if one, if a protein state can transmit information to the daughter cell and that gives a daughter cell an advantage, heck yeah. Yeah, Jackpot. Heck yeah, I'll use it. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's in the toolbox. The fact that it's pathological um, in some cases is unfortunate right but it's um yeah i, I, I thought it was a really point, a really well-made point the yeah point, right it's like we need proteins to be flexible yeah um, and, and we can talk about this condensates which are like a, a very much a new thing in biology and really attuned to that but um yeah we need them to be flexible to do their jobs and they exist in an energy landscape and sometimes the energy landscape that allows them to achieve their appropriate confirmation is close enough to one that allows them to achieve a pathological confirmation as well. I kind of came away then amazed that we don't see those pathologies more frequently. I suspect we have mechanisms in our body to prevent that a lot. Or or, yeah, 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 for example, amyloid plaques, like there, we we have this machine in our cells, sorry, Used to the, the no no you you, you, you no, you're uh, I I feel like I yeah I don't want to be like anti metaphor it's a it's a garbage disposal it's called right. a proteasome and so you know messed up proteins get put into this <laughs> little funnel they get chewed up 
and they get spat back out and recycled. Right? Yeah. And um, I, you know, I suspect that there are there are many ways and are many times in our body that proteins get messed up, right. oxidized, for example, and um, they have to be they they somehow the cell senses that and pulls it into this get out of here. And yeah. Like, undoes that, right? It's, a, it's a, but it's a buffering capacity, and you have something that causes the stimulation of the accumulation of these at a rate that's greater than the ability to remove them, you run into a problem, right? There's also a disease called amyloidosis. It's a, huh. uh, a protein that's involved in um, binding and, and carrying a uh, thyroid hormone around a body. Um, it's thyroid hormone. Uh, but it, it folds into an, al an alternate conformation, and it deposits all over. In oh, interesting. It's, uh, but it's rare. It is rare. It is rare. But it's it's one of these things like like Alzheimer's disease. You'll get it if you live long enough. Right, right. Oh, that's interesting. Right? Yeah. Um, and that's why the diseases that people die from are often not genetic diseases. It makes that point in the book, right? All the common diseases that are really bad are not genetic diseases. It's because the genetic diseases will kill you young, right? Right. <laughs> the, the, the diseases that kill people in modern society are the ones that you're, you're, you're the winner, right? Yeah. <laughs> you died of something that's like not obviously a genetic disease, right? right. It's, like it's, acquired, it's an acquired state, right? right? You know, right. In your artery, like, yeah, Greg, you may not have a calling as a priest administering last rites. <laughs> I, I, I got to tell you, I'm not sure that that's good. Uh, Anton Mander, it's like, and I'm here with another winner. I got another winner. It is winner, winner, chicken dinner in here. You're like, uh, I'm dying. I'm like, well, no, no. Hey, listen. Congratulations. It's, not a genetic Congratulations. it's like a balloons drop. We have not a genetic disorder. You won. Uh, but I, did, you, did you ever read Deadly Feasts, Adam, by Richard no. Rhodes? Um, so this is one of the, you, know, you get these books that like go around a social group and this is one of those that like Richard Rhodes wrote Dark Sun uh, and wrote this book called Deadly Feasts in like the late 90s. And like if you want to get scared about prions, like you can scare yourself about prions. Like you take these things because they're not viruses or bacteria and you can irradiate them and you can do all sorts of like nasty stuff to them. You can burn them and then you can like inject it and inject it into a mouse brain and like, yeah, the mouse like dies of Kuru or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, just, they're just like, um, surgical instruments are now often disposable. Uh, Stainless steel, disposable surgical instruments. For exactly that reason. For exactly that reason. That's really interesting because of you, you cannot eradicate it. Of, of it's, prion. It's, yeah. Interesting. Uh, you know, it's, they're almost indestructible. And so on the one hand, I remember reading that book and being like, yo, I'm definitely like scared. And, but now kind of in hindsight, I'm like, well, wait a minute. I also should have been asking myself the immediate follow-up question. Like, Hey, hold on. Like, this is, why are these so rare? I mean, these are super, super rare and unusual. They happen under unusual conditions. It's like, there's gotta be more to the story here. And it can't just be that we're all going to like Eye of Kuru. Oh, but, oh, but that said, that said, do not eat the brains of the deceased. No, not Especially if they died like bonking in the walls. <laughs> this and stuff is like that. medical advice, people. Yes. This is yeah. medical advice. This is medical advice. Normally, we don't give that much yeah. medical advice in the show, but yeah. like, just don't eat the brains of your disoriented enemies, yeah. is what I would say. Adam, I'm really just concerned that, like, like look, <laughs> I, I, I have. I do have latent fear. I, you know, this latent fear that I'm projecting on other people that, like, I'm going to get eaten. They say your cats will eat you. Three days after you die. And I can just feel it's really changed my relationship with the cats. I just feel that they are like, <laughs> I, I think if you're in this, I just feel that they're just like eyeing me over. They're like looking and I can't kind of like, there's a lot of me that I feel is not edible, but I feel like the cats are going to be like, we're, we're, we're going to be the judge of what's edible and what's not edible, pal. But like the brain, like eat that at your own risk. Yeah. Again, I, 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 I could have told you thought that's true. I can't recommend eating brains. <laughs> and actually uh, the, there are people who've gotten, um, um, disease with eating squirrel brains yeah actually, in the united states um i don't know what it is about brains but uh, you should not go for them you know I, the sweetbreads though are also tasty they are very good is this um, culinary advice or medical advice now we're, we're, we're right in that gray area aren't we we're right in that gray <laughs> i'm not thinking bad about the pancreas so <laughs> there we go the, 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 eat up well the you have to when adam was reading fast food nation most people read fast food nation and became vegetarians <laughs> And Adam read Fast Food Nation. He's like, I got to tell you, like, it's making me hungry. I'm like, I want a burger. Starving, I'm like, right? I'm like, you, that is, a, you are not in a big demographic, pal. There are a lot of people. No, you should read the book. Like, also, like, I want a burger. And we're going to go to Jack in the Box, by the way, because they're the ones that have, like, they had to figure all this stuff out. Like, fly the airline that just crashed. They're the one that are paying, they're, they're the ones that are paying attention. It's like, yeah, go to, Wend don't go to Wendy's. Go to Wendy's at your own risk. But um, the, uh, so, 
yeah, this is not necessarily, I don't know if this is culinary advice or medical advice, but <laughs> brains, brains are delicious, but not of the, not of your enemies that died of disorientation. Yeah. I don't know. You know what? And, actually, the, the second big, second visit, <laughs> second biggest um, tissue that expresses the preom protein outside of the brain is actually the bone marrow, oddly. So, um, you know, personally, I don't eat oxtail. Ooh, short food. ribs too. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, we, the, the, uh, this feels mean spirited. Just you're, you're, Greg, you're just here to take things off the menu. This is like I, I the um, all right, the oxtail soup. This is I'm kind of like, like osabuco. Come on, I mean, uh, uh, yeah. brains fine. Yeah. Osabuco, yeah. I'm not sure. We'll see. That, okay, well, yeah. What other are there other other things? What other foods that you do not eat based on your? You, you know, this reminds me <laughs> of a short list. the well that I had a um I, I met a toxicologist once and and he's like, I got to tell you, uh, don't pump your own gas. That the and this is in the era when gas was unshielded. He's like benzene is such absolutely bad news, and if you are ever, especially if you are in like a dusty environment, do not pump your own gas because the benzene will bind to the dust. Go, you'll breathe it in, and you just it will not. I, I think you just you know fresh off of a benzene bender or whatever studying benzene. I you know don't overweight that advice, but yeah. you know there you go. It's like no oxtail soup. Don't pump your own gas. Like everyone's filled <laughs> with good good. good. This is a you're, this is news you can use today on yeah. oxide and friends. You, know, you thought you're going to get a right. exactly. You thought you were going to get a dry discussion of of a, a really interesting book, but no. no. Um, hey, so uh, the, yeah, Brian. Question for you: Did did you see in all of this Alan Turing on the horizon? Okay, Greg, so I'm no, sure I, you I, did. I, I, I'm, I was I'm, completely I'm, t- surprised to see it. I was com- completely surprised to see it. I would no. I I knew we were going to get the Turing at some point, and the the um. No, that was a huge surprise to me. I had no idea. So Alan Turing is the rightfully thought of as the father of computer science. I mean, there are a handful of them that are these early pioneers, but uh, but Turing is definitely one of them. Maybe now is the time to mention the part of the book that maybe I had to take a break from. <laughs> you, do you, yeah. you know exactly what this is. You know the passage, I'm sure, Adam. Uh, uh, I'm with, sure it has to do with, with artificial intelligence. Uh, close. The, mm. uh, the Once a relatively obscure figure... Turing is now widely hailed as a visionary genius, thanks in part to the 2014 biopic The Imitation Game and the decision to feature him on the British 50-pound note. I'm like, <laughs> no, I think the book got thrown out the balcony at that. I'm like, I'm like, book, you and I need a break. Like, I'm sorry, The Imitation Game. Did you see The Imitation Game? No, I've never heard of it, but I've heard of Alan Turing. For sure. Okay, The Imitation Game, first of all, terrible. I felt Adam. I don't know that I watched it. It's bad. It just—it's it's like Benedict Cumberbatch, right? It's B- Benedict Cumberbatch, and like this is like the story of Alan Turing and Enigma, which is an extraordinary right. story. Is apparently too boring for the big screen, so we're just gonna like fill in a bunch of stuff that we think would be more exciting and interesting, and along with some kind of ridiculous characterization of what we think a computer scientist looks like and very much into like the lone madman kind of a thing. It's bad. It's bad. It, it, this is one of these where my kids are like, this is why we can't go to these kinds of movies with you. Like you are, this is <laughs> like, why can't you just like, ro- like you can't just chill and watch a movie. Like you have my, that's because I can't chill and watch a movie that's garbage. But it's so the idea that like, to, so in computer science, the, the, the Nobel prize equivalent First of all, any discipline that has to say Nobel Prize equivalent just shows you that it's like ultimately like eating at the kids' table from a intellectual discourse perspective. But the Nobel Prize equivalent for us is the Turing Award. Okay. So, the, 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 I mean, Alan Turing, very well known in computer science. I think known outside of computer science before. I don't. I, and but I don't think the. I don't. I think mean, the, you don't think the fifty pound note was the tipping point. I think the fifty pound note moved the needle on he's Alan British. Turing. He's British, man. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I yeah, no, that's true. I was British, and it's like, and look, like the guy's got a lot. I mean, also it's like. Do people know Ulysses S. Grant? I, I mean, right. are, are they just like, <laughs> one's a relatively obscure figure. Yeah, like yeah. people, I, I mean, come on. But then, right, you take uh, 50, 50 units of currency and then forget about it, right to no, the top of the charts. Right to the top of the charts. Like, who's this guy on my 50 pound note? I want to know a lot more about him. Tell me more. It's, wait a minute. It's the guy from the imitation game. I know him. No longer a relatively uh. obscure figure. You, Alan Turing. Um, all right, there you go. Rant off. Uh, I, then I go retrieve the book from the balcony that I've thrown it off of and you know, kind of retrieve it out of the yard. Um, but I did not know Adam at all. And so is this well-known in biology that Alan Turing, how much is this is like someone who has got a computer science background in terms of Alan Turing's role in 
uh, in some of these uh, the, the and what was the, the exact the exact term? But I, it was very surprising to me. I had no idea that Alan Turing had done it's anything. Like the, about the Turing patterning, like the, the describing yes, yeah. Yeah, no, everything from that. zebra yeah. strikes to like you know having five fingers. I guess I I knew that there was mass behind that and that those patterns can emerge. I, yeah. I wasn't aware that he did that. I had no idea. Um, yeah. I had I had no idea, and it was really really interesting. Um, and Gaurav actually put me onto another computer science uh, computer scientist, um, Leslie Valiant. I'm not sure won the Turing Award in 2011, and his Turing Award lecture is really interesting because this is one of the ones that he talks about. One of the things that he's grappling with is that the that it feels like Darwin alone, neo Darwinism can't explain all of the richness that we've selected. Natural selection alone is kind of like not enough. And that it's like, it's too much has happened. It's too fast. Um, which I thought was, it, it, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm butchering, I'm sure his, his, his work and, and his Turing Award lecture, but I thought it was interesting where he, cause he gets into this kind of like information preservation role uh -huh. that we have in biology, which I guess what we were talking about earlier in terms of like the, the ultimate role being to kind of, and Turing viewing it as an information problem, I thought was super interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think actually there are a few instances in the book where um, Philip Paul says, "Oh, how could it possibly be DNA that's encoding all this?" And it, it's sort of, I don't know. I find that a little bit of a weak argument, right? Because, well, it, I I think it must be because that's what there is, right? Right. Um, it's. Um, Can I ask? Yeah. I, I like a super dumb question. That the so one of the things that I grappled with as a kid, and I'm not sure Adam if you ever grappled with this, but like when you first learn about a compiler, right? And you've got this like, okay, a compiler is something that takes a programming language yeah. and generates like assembly code that you can run. It's a, it's an oversimplification. But like, what do you write the compiler in? And people talk about like, no, like we wrote the compiler in in the language that we developed the compiler for. And I remember at like before kind of learning about how these systems are bootstrapped, you're like what? It does not make any sense. Like, you need to have an existing compiler. How do you compile the compiler? How do you compile the compiler? Yeah, yeah. Right? It's like, how do you have the first compiler? And like, the reality is right now, if you want to build a new compiler, you don't have to do it in assembly, right? You get to write a compiler in a higher level language because that compiler already exists. Yeah. But you are very much implicitly dependent on that compiler. It, that and that is implicitly dependent on the compiler that created the so chicken, it, right? Totally. <laughs> and is the it, it feels like with DNA, like you've got DNA, but you also have like the computer that is the thing. I mean, again, to go with the torture metaphor, but like that's the like you need that as well, and that's the thing that's also. I mean, that's not being passed through only in DNA when the cell is replicating. It's not just the DNA. It's okay. also like replicating a bunch of this other goop is, I mean, is, is, like we, so we, in other words, like we can't just start from DNA from scratch. Is that? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think chicken and egg go way back. <laughs> <laughs> right? right. I mean, like, you know, people speculate, like what's the origin of life. Right. But, um, like, I guess the current thinking that's RNA was actually the original self-replicating mode, right? And, you know, somehow this started making proteins. And um, so I think RNA is thought to be the chicken. Uh, RNA is the chicken. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, are, are you having us wait in on one side of the, is there going to be some other like, oh, I can't, of course he said RNA is the chicken. That's what the RNA chicken people uh, say. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't have a strong, I don't have a horse in this race really. But, uh, yeah, no. Or chicken. Yeah, or chicken. Um, so RNA predates DNA is kind of the thinking. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. It feels like the origin. I mean, I definitely found myself like way more interested in that origin of life question, I feel. I mean, again, not a deep thought. Yeah, no, Wait. it's fascinating. And in a way, like I think he makes this point in the book. And I've, I've, when I've taught more junior people, I'm like, no, you got to like, sure, you know this, but like, why does it have to be right? Why why can't why do we need RNA at all? Right. Right. Why 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 can't DNA just be opened up and just be translated directly? Yes. There's actually nothing stopping that from being true, but right. it is not true, right? And you know there are, there are reasons like okay maybe you uh, you want to amplify a signal and if you have 
translating directly off the DNA, you can only make as much as the that one copy will get you, right? So, and fair enough. And I, obviously, you have to replicate your DNA. Maybe it would expose it to multiple damage and breaks. So there, there are certainly, like, reasons, right? But, right. like, there's not... It's a little bit of an... A priori, it's a little bit of an ugly way to design it, right? Especially yeah, interesting. Like, with uh, tRNAs as well, right? So these are the, the RNAs that have amino acids stuck to them, and they're, they're, they're what actually decodes the mRNA, right? And uh, the ribosomes, this machine... <laughs> that that, that um, puts our proteins together by grabbing the right tRNA and making sure that the, the three base pairs at the end match uh, the RNA, right? I'd say, like, couldn't there have been some, like, more elegant way to do that? Like, it's a little bit... <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, I think it doesn't make sense, in, except if you think huh. that, you know, maybe the RNAs were doing it first, and then the proteins kind of came along and ended up helping out, right? And then DNA was, like, some sort of... Like cold storage, if you will. It's a, yeah, right. You know, we talking about AWS earlier. Yeah, right. right. Like, there's like the what's it called, ice cube or something? Glacier. Glacier. They They're, call it. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that's like DNA's glacier, right? <laughs> right. All right. Yeah, I didn't realize that. The, 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 okay. Yeah, DNA is on that yeah. that, that that deep storage. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. In fact, if you it, you know if um, people thought, well, how did how did it's the same chicken egg question, right? Like making proteins. Well, you need a ribosome to make proteins, but the ribosome is made out of so. How did that? Come How did that get going? And, and yeah. really, it's, it's actually it's, that's pretty clear because people solve the structure of the ribosome. It is mostly RNA. Interesting. Really the RNA is doing all the the chemistry and the heavy lifting, right? The proteins are just kind of there to tweak it in the right direction. So it's, it's pretty easy to understand to, to see what the origin of that, that might be. You unwind yeah. the tape, right? Like the RNA could probably do it, just not very well, right? So right. The, it makes a protein that helps it do a little bit better, and then the selective drive the selective drive and it, that is happening in prokaryotes as well as eukaryotes oh, yeah. yeah right yeah. so this they is have a different ribosome but yeah it's, it's so common. this is going back to our common ancestor oh yeah. 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 whatever this is this yeah. mechanism is yeah. is and and there's a like again i mean not to, there's a lot going on in that era that like extended, you know, again, what it, that's like a billion the plus first years. Billion years. The first billion like, years is like a big deal, right? Yeah. I, you know, any, any low probability event times infinite time times a billion years. Yeah. You'll get something, right? You'll get something. And, you know, I, that's like maybe a, a good theme for me in general is like before we had the ability to, to study the human genome or whatever, or to study a complex organism, people said, okay, I'm going to study E. coli or I'm going to study yeast would study a fruit fly or a nematode that's going to be a model for how humans work or larger right animals. right right because, right yeah that's what that's what taxpayers want they want to understand <laughs> that's what taxpayers they want they want to understand <laughs> humans and disease and, and, and <laughs> right understand yeah, yeah right 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 and so people said or study phages that was the, the first one of the first ones right like bacteriophages right the smaller right. The, and so that was a really a way to study things that were tractable Experimentally tractable, yeah. Re reduce complexity. But the yeah. amazing thing is, to me, and this is one of the big themes in biology. I think the past 30, 40 years. The amazing thing is that really the guts of how organisms work, is, let's say eukaryotic eukaryotic organisms work, it's really kind of the same. Yeah, interesting. That there so, is a lot of value. Yeah, yeah, like yeah a right, lot of right. like just like how the cell decides to stop and go, how that's the internal parts of the cell work. Obviously, there are a lot of differences, but there are a lot of similarities. Yeah, interesting. From, from yeast to us, right? Right. And that didn't have to be true. And I think we just kind of lucked out at a lot of the knowledge that we were able to discover by studying those microorganisms and smaller organisms like flies and, and worms. Really, it actually did play out and give a, a not so indirect understanding of interesting. Of human yeah, yeah, yeah. Biology. Right. And then when someone comes along with archaea, you're like, get this out of here. Yeah. No one wants to see this. What are you doing here? Yeah. Ar uh, I mean, uh, Carl Wosey was a guy who discovered archaea, like a definitely an under-recognized uh, man. He died a few years ago. Um, remarkable guy. Yeah. He used an in insane techniques in a time when really people shouldn't have been able to discover what he discovered. And he persisted in no one believed him for a while. It's one of these stories where no one believed him for a while. I mean, Oh, I mean, it is a bit of a grand claim. Uh, yeah, it's like I think I've got a new branch of life, and you're like, okay, easy. Yeah, I know, but it was, it was looking at different ribosomal RNAs, as I recall. Is how we got using 
paper electrophoresis. He was like putting them on a big sheet of paper coated in salt water and putting extremely high voltages across this piece of paper. They probably caught on fire half of the time, right? <laughs> and then, yeah. Then making it radioactive and then spreading out across this piece of paper and then trying to discern patterns from it. Um, heroic, back in the heroic age of technology. Yeah, that's really interesting. And and then so, and I feel like this is also like a common theme in the book that you've got a bunch of folks that are ahead of where other people are. It's kind of a lonely spot. Yeah. I mean, you've got whether it's Prions or Archaea or you kind of like ahead of some of this stuff and it takes a long time for people to catch up and realize like, yeah, okay, you, you were you were on to something. Yeah, it's pretty it's just important like, it's just like natural selection, like most mutations are bad. I'm, without being a pessimist, maybe most new ideas are wrong. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but the ones that are right, uh, um, yeah, sometimes they take a while to get accepted because they are so unconventional, right? And maybe even there's a correlation between the, the meaningfulness and how the novelty of an idea and how how long it takes to catch on. Because as uh, you know, Carl Sagan said, uh, uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary Very evidence, right? Right. Yeah, that's right. That, that, yeah, I, I wasn't sure if you're going to go that or you're going to go to the Thomas Kuhn, uh, scientists, science advances one funeral uh, at a time. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. that's kind of the, 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 yeah. the, the other, the other side of that. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. And then, so what do you make of, you know, the, actually, can I just ask you about conjoined twins? No, no, no. I know. I, 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 this is, listen, if I got legal advice, I'm going to ask Adam and he's going to dispense legal advice or accounting <laughs> advice or medical advice. So I, I, I want you to be, so because one of the things he actually mentions in here is that conjoined twins are the result of an incomplete separation. I don't think that's right. I already, so the, the, I read a very interesting book a couple years ago called mutants that talks about Conjoined twins are actually, it's like, no, no, it's, it's you, you've got, you've got these different morphogens that are actually, you're, it's not an incomplete separation or an incomplete fusion, which is kind of like the conventional idea, but that you are actually have got morphogens in two different spots. And so you're actually like getting cell differentiation going where it shouldn't be going because you're getting, is that. That's an interesting, I, I, so I, I, I don't know. And okay. I'm not going to try to profess on something I don't really know about. I think clearly we do see identical twins happen, right? So right. That there must be a process by which there can be separation. For sure. And so um, is it true that joined twins are a failure of that a kind of weird process? Or is it, or is it something like that's radically different. never faded to split? And it, it, like you're saying, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different type of... Uh, unlikely outcome from a developmental biology perspective. Well, that he, I don't know. Because one of the things, and, and Ball kind of goes into a bunch of these examples in the book where how these very early groups of cells get orientation, get like left versus right, and get some of their asymmetry and kind of get like the cilia and, and you've got this turbulent flow that help to, uh, okay, for the record, you're rolling your eyes a little bit. You're just like, so you skeptical on that one. That, uh, that one's just like. I don't, I. I guess with all due respect to the biologists who figured it out, I don't see symmetry breaking as hard just because there's the environment out there, right? And, Interesting, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, what, what's the first thing that happens to um, fertilize egg? It travels down the fallopian tube and it implants in the uterus. There's asymmetry right there, right? So I, I, I don't know, but I, I'm speaking a little bit of ag ignorance here, so I don't want to. No, that's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll go through our mailbag yeah. as we get some of the, the <laughs> I, I, I'm sure the, well, and, and this is where you get to like gas relation, which is definitely a, I, uh, that's, Adam, is that, I mean, it's not exactly a Scrabble word. Is that one? <laughs> not, not one that I had come across no points, before. No. no points. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 I mean, if it's basically, if it's a, first of all, it's a two letter word, just like Adam flat out knows it. It doesn't even, and in fact, the, even if it's not a two letter word, but it's in the Scrabble dictionary, Adam definitely knows it. And, it, <laughs> it, and if, it, if it's, if he, he can use it on a rack, he will definitely know it. Once you hit seven letters though, you begin to get, so I, when I saw gas relation, Adam, I wondered, had you heard, I had not heard that word. That was no, definitely, no, no, no. Yeah, okay, that, no that, that was a new one to you too. Yeah. Um, but interesting about the, the, the kind of the whole uh, gas relation being this kind of development uh, where you actually get this kind of cell differentiation early, early, early cell differentiation. Or is that my butchering? Oh, no, no, absolutely. It's um, I think the earlier you go back in development, uh, it's we're necessarily in a game where things are very finely tuned. Things can't break. 
in that process, right? Or you'll have a miscarriage, for example, right? right. So right. there's extremely strong selective pressure to get it right. Right. And um, when it's, it, there's got to be, because this is something that also I've had a hard time squaring with respect to just like, because our pace of evolution is extremely slow. Like very slow. 20 years versus 20 minutes. 20 years versus 20 minutes. You've got like, we can't reproduce very much. We don't have very many shots at it. Like if you're going to like miscarry a bunch, like you only got like that, that, you do not have many shots at that. Like you have got to get it right, basically. Yeah. It's amazing to me how it gets it right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty stunning. It is pretty, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, another thing I wanted to ask you about, because I, the the synthetic biology stuff and the this xenobots. This is like the, the last, oh, the, the xenobots. Last, yeah, 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 the did, xenobots. Did, yeah. Did this, did any of this kind of turn your guys' stomachs at all? Like I, I it, it was interesting to me. Like it, it was, it, it was a, not a little I don't bit know gross. where you're going with that one. Did it make you no, hungry? Just, you know what it is? No, you no, want, no, they, no, Were you like, no. God, I could go with some first, God. some frog embryo like, right now. Oh, it'd be so no. God, like a little cracker. Oh, like good, with a way to make fake frog legs. <laughs> it, was, Ooh, it, was a little, mm. it was a little terrifying. The xenobots. Uh, you yeah. should see the frogs. Those, the frogs, they come from uh, Xenopus lavis are big. They have claws. They're aggressive. They thrash around in the tanks. Huh. Huh. Most people study the eggs from them. They have to actually inject them <laughs> to make them hyperovulate. They inject them with exactly like IVF medicine, right? And you have to squeeze the eggs out. Like you had this big thrashing pain cushion to this big puff of frog. <laughs> you have to squeeze the eggs out. It's, it's, that's, so, okay, why? Why is this like, does this frog, why, what is it about this frog? It that is really big eggs. Big eggs. Big eggs. So it's like... Also, they hate them. They just hate these frogs. <laughs> they also uh, hate these frogs. I, I Feeling sounds mutual. Uh, they're, they're, um, they're not cute, and they're not fairly friendly. Um, but I, I, I think... Uh, They've got that, physically large eggs. Absolutely. And, and one of the weird things about these eggs is that um, cell division happens in a very strange manner, and that the size of the total mass of... The, Cell, an organism doesn't change, but it just gets subdivided over and over and over. So it starts out with a huge, abnormally large cell. It, 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 this is frog this, development. this frog. Yeah, yeah. And this is not just like everything, right? Or is this, uh, this is unusual? Yeah, uh, more so than most, right? Okay. Um, and so you, you can see these single cells. They're they're big, right? And, wow. And the first, you know. Eight, sixteen 16 divisions of the of the embryo doesn't the size the total size doesn't change it just gets dna replicated and gets subdivided wow. so it goes very quickly and you so you can you can study that process easily i think that i, I believe that was the, uh, the intent between studying these frogs but then you know, obviously i guess um uh, mike levin one of the yeah pulled off some of these cells and you know, kind of probably as a stunt, or like I, was, yeah. I think of it as a nice hack, right? Right, 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 you know, right, right. right. Like yeah, pulled off the cells and said, "Oh, I wonder what happens if I break it in this way." And he like ripped some cells off, and they kept growing. And then, you know, the cells have their programming, like they want to, they want uh, to their blueprint again. Right. Not that I'm calling it that. It's not in the spirit of the book, I suppose. But um, you know, they have their programming, and they want to be next to other cells, and they want their cilia to go in a certain way, and you know, for whatever reason, that helps make a normal frog right but when you take it out of that context it you get these like amusing weird like they're called xenobots xenobots yeah, yeah. and i mean i thought there's like a very interesting question about like are these things life or not they've got to be yeah, yeah right right sure yeah the wikipedia page is like a controversy about whether these things are alive. Are these robots? Like, I think this is like, no, this is especially guarded with my new brain blowing up about the entropy defying nature of life. Like this satisfy, I think I mean, this, this checks that box. I, you know, what is life, right? I, I don't know. I mean, there's nature doesn't, it doesn't divide itself much along such clean lines. Yeah. Right. right. Some people right, think right. viruses aren't alive. I don't know. I'm more like, it's made out of biological macromolecules and it can replicate itself and, and it's alive. Those, Which, in that case, xenobots are not alive, right? Because 
But they clearly are alive because they're out there and doing something in their environment. And so what do you think about this thermodynamic kind of definition of life? Thermodynamic disequilibrium basically being the definition of life, which is more or less what Philip what Paul was saying. I think it includes all the things we currently think of life, but it would include some weird things like crystals or something, right? Which are right. probably we don't want to put in that category, but you know, on the other or, or artificial intelligence, right? I mean, uh, oh boy, here we are. Okay, look, uh, hey, hey, I didn't even bring it up. I didn't even bring it up, Adam. So I, you got like, just, flip it over, I'm just flip to, it over. Did you have an hour and twenty five on your to, card? Because I no, managed to get through this whole goddamn thing without even mentioning this. Much I got earlier. Lots of no, you're right. Exactly. I know, and I knew you thought that I would not summon the self control. Who knew that it would be our guest who would actually like crack the seal? <laughs> Completely on, unprompted. Can we, can we, brother, I've got this sign that I've had up for, for an hour and a half tapping now. The sign. Is, <laughs> I'm tapping the sign over and over and over again. Greg's just giving me weird looks and I'm like, say the words. Uh, yeah. Well, so I think that like that I've, I've got, I've got, a, I've got opinions about that because yeah. I feel that in reading this, and I'm curious, you've got opinions as well. I think that like we it, just in general, we have done ourselves an enormous disservice by anthropomorphizing these things we've built. Yeah. And I think that that metaphor, so just as like, I think the machine metaphor is, can be powerful, but is dangerous and can be overly reductive. I think the life metaphor for the machines that we've built is also, in fact, I think is even worse. And I think is like, no, like this looks nothing like that. By the way, nothing, nothing like that, nothing like this. This is like, these are not the same at all. They look nothing like one another. And like, go have some frogs hyper ovulate on you that some ornery frogs, like if you want to go like learn what life is, go extract some of these eggs from these hyper ovulating frogs with like a bad attitude. Like that's life. Like go do that. Like this idea of these kind of like of these, you know, stochastic parrots, um, Giver's line, but the, the this is not the, these don't look at all like these systems. And I mean, we can't even be like just to be random. Randomness is really important. Like these are stochastic systems that these physical systems. It's really hard to be random. Really, really hard to be random. And in fact, it's like to be truly random because cryptography depends on it. We have to be like it, it's actually pretty hard to be really, really random. So we can. Use like radioactive decay, or the, the, so you the use or like SRAM actually cells can be if you the, 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 you can get you have to get the randomness in nature basically, okay. and but it's it's really hard, and then everything else is kind of pseudo random from that, right? The but the, the, these systems don't look any, and I think we do ourselves an enormous disservice when we we because when we conflate them, we kind of think that like oh we've done this thing over here, so it allows us to understand these systems so that the. the a synthetic system is going to allow us to have kind of convey under, and I'm just like, no, I don't, I, I, after, especially after I didn't buy it going into this book, but coming out of it, I'm like, no way. These things are not at all the same. And they, there's, there's little, I don't know, Adam, what did you, did you have? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I guess, I guess I had, a, a you know, looking at like neural networks, I, you know, I, I think that maybe to your point, this is modeled on, our deeply imprecise understanding of the brain, like profound, and then a simplification of that and a simplification of that. The thing I did see in common is sort of like the, this is a complex system whose inner operations we don't actually fully understand from first principles. Sure. Right, that, yeah. that like, I'm gonna run this neural network, it's gonna come out with some results, and I can't tell you why this weighting is, is, has its particular value. But uh, what comes out <laughs> seems to, do what I was hoping it to, it would do, and then some other surprising things. When it's not being but, a racist. When, well, I mean, that part is sort of least surprising, I guess. <laughs> right, I guess. <laughs> right, garbage in, garbage out. But I, but I guess, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that in, I, I to definitely agreed that any analysis that's like, let's take this imprecise model of our half understood system and then use that as a proxy to understand the original system is full of problems fraught with peril for yeah, sure totally agreed um he, and adam has dropped in into the chat has dropped in an image of one of these frogs i gotta say like i do not want to pick this i like <laughs> no you get its eggs yeah. i'm not to hell I'm with not, that guy right oh that guy Take exactly. that frog too <laughs> the um 
it, 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 and do you think that the, the Xenobots, because it's an interesting kind of hack, yeah. is there anything there that is, are, are, you know, as we kind of look to the future of what's going to be possible? Because, again, I feel that, like, the systems that we engineer look nothing like these biological systems, and we are a long, 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 long way away from making an engineered system that operates like life operates. Yeah, you know, I, I remember seeing the Xenobots when they came out some years ago. Yeah. I, honestly, I kind of forgot about it until I read the book. Yeah, interesting. Um, I don't know. I think it's fairly early. If you talk about trying to, like, sculpt the cells or engineer with cells in a multicellular context, very little is being done with that, to my knowledge. Yeah, interesting. There are people who are doing, like, um, making artificial skin, for example, and that's wonderful, but that's not – I don't really view that as related to this, right? I, I don't know. Um, not my field, honestly. I haven't followed it, but yeah, it seems more like a, an interesting trick to me. That then, then, uh, then that's a fundamental, fundamental, right? a fundamental man. Okay. So, what, yeah, what, what is your what, what are your kind of takeaways from the book? Then, kind of writ large, in terms of like you got a, the this is uh, what is the new biology <laughs> to you? Yeah, I you know I don't know. I think I'm. Um, a bit of a reductionist, right? Okay. Like in the beginning of the book, he, he there's a diagram, and it's like he has a picture of DNA. Then there's a big, literally a big black box, and then there's like a, an arrow connecting that, and there's another arrow, and it goes to like life, right? Right. And so, you know, what's in the black box, right? And I think that's what the book attempts to explain. I think there are a, a lot of things that have been covered that really add some depth, some complexity, some, um, some richness to that picture, and it is really complicated, and it's. It's more than just uh, a straight linear correlation between the DNA and the output. The yeah. environment largely intervenes. Random noise intervenes. Um, molecular fluctuation intervenes. Absolutely, he's right. That some of the um, the uh, metaphor we use to talk about things, but wrong. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I think science that he's railing against in some ways. Is, I got a lot right too, however, right? Um, for example, there was um, it, we were talking talking about if you knew everything about the state of information in the protein organization in the cell, could you model life, right? And uh, this famous biologist, his name is Sidney Brenner, and uh, discovered a good bit of the genetic code and uh, the nature of the genetic code back in the in the, in the days of the early sixties. He founded something up in Berkeley probably about 20 years ago now. I don't think it exists anymore. It was called the Molecular Sciences Institute. Okay. The premise of the institute was like, okay, damn it. We're going to, we're actually going to like figure out all these, all the, the numbers and the, uh, over time of, uh, and over the stage of development of, of, uh, of all the different proteins and RNAs in a yeast cell. That was their model. We're going to simulate a yeast yeah, cell. They're going to, they're going to understand as a function of like the cell going through the, the, like S, the replication right. or um, how, how proteins fluctuate against one another. Um, and I think, unfortunately, you'd have to look at all the interactions between the proteins. Right. And so it, gets, right. it gets insurmountable very quickly, unfortunately. Right. Um, but I think that level of detail is where life is happening, right? It's like you have 100,000 different molecules of every protein in the cell and each one interacts with five other proteins at some affinity unless one of them has a phosphate group on it or you know and it's it's contextual or unless some rna comes and binds it and it's 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 somewhat unfathomable i mean the way we can study this problem is to change the dna right right so and we can see how that changes those the output of that process but Sometimes it's a lot of hard work and with techniques that are less well developed to understand what happens in between. Right. right? To right. understand, like, you change the affinity of one molecule for another by a factor of 10%. So it's very difficult to measure that. But maybe that's enough. Right. To change to, to throw the cell down a new developmental pathway or to have it separate and cleave into a new embryo or not. Right. These things are very subtle. And, um, you know, I, I'd, uh, I think, I don't know if it'll ever be possible, honestly, to really understand things at that level. Um, but uh, look, a lot of what, a lot of what he 
a lot of the new things he's mentioning in the book really add to the picture, right? I think in particular, um, no one understood the role that RNA played in the cell. People thought for, for sure that it was just mRNA and then tRNA, with this decoding RNA. And I think certainly in the past 10 or 20 years, people, or maybe 20, 30 years, people have started to understand RNA is everywhere. Yeah, interesting. It's everywhere. And um, in particular, and also I think one of, the, one of the other things he brought up was like the, the disordered proteins. Um, and, and you know, sometimes disorder is under, easily understood, right? You have a, like a, a follow, you determine the structure of a protein and you see, well, some parts aren't in the structure and it's because they're moving around and they don't diffract x-ray as well. Or even in a, um, there's a new technique or a newer technique called cryo-electron microscopy. They, you can exist in alternate conformations that can be hard to resolve. You can understand that pretty easily. It's like a, taking a picture of someone playing sports and they're throwing a ball and their hand is blurry, right? It's because when you, you'd say, oh, well, it's disordered. Well, that's because it's, it's part that's doing something. Right, 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 right. <laughs> so right, right, that, right. That's easy to understand, but what's harder to understand, and I think um, very, a very almost a foreign concept is something that was discovered in the past maybe 10 years about how proteins can exist really almost in their own different phase of matter, right? It is certainly the conventional way to think about it is a protein exists in solution. There's water around, there's some salt. The salt's making some of the amino acids and the proteins happy. Um, but the cell's really, really, really crowded place. And there are, it's so crowded that I think there's not really enough, almost not enough water to go around. Like the proteins, things, things like to be with things that are like themselves. And that's why proteins fold up on themselves, right? Because that's the energetic, typically energetic minimum. Yeah, right. Be. Interesting. But if you have enough of these proteins that don't have and necessarily have an intrinsic structure, they can kind of bomb together and um, maybe even form a, like almost a phase that's outside of an, the aqueous phase, right? It's almost like if you have, um, what would be a great example? Like if you have oil and water, right? Obviously, they form separate phases and you shake it up and then they reassort, right? Um, and so... I think, I think to many people's surprise, this seems to be able to happen with proteins and maybe RNAs as well. And when I, honestly, when I first learned about that, I was really depressed mm -hmm. <laughs> because I knew it meant, I knew it was probably true and I knew it was, uh, it explained a lot of things, but it also means it was extremely difficult to study. Yeah, because interesting. All of our techniques have rely on really things being in an aqueous environment. It's extremely, oh. it's, it's, it's a new area in biology and a lot's being discovered about it, but um, it's not one that's very amenable to, to study. study. And I'm, it, I'm he, worried that a lot of biology is going to depend on this type of phenomenon. And can we, does that path of simulating like the, you know, the, 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 the like the, the project at Berkeley to, yeah. to simulate the yeast, can we, if we take this kind of does the thermodynamic approach of kind of like because it feels like so much of this is about optimizing energy and and optimizing the it's so efficient does that kind of guide the way we would develop simulation at all is that a totally naive question no it totally could um you know um you and your friends have made computers amazing right and um have enabled computational power to increase to such an extent that um, it's now possible to do what are called molecular dynamics uh, calculations. Um, now, I think several over the over the span of several seconds, right, which is a, an insanely long time in the atomic scale, right? When I started graduate school, they were they were they were looking at like picosecond was amazing. You could simulate a picosecond, right? 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 Yeah, right. Um, wow. So Moore's law. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, right. Yes. And. You know, and that, that's the time frame that biology happens on. Like, like you can a protein if, it, if it's not going to find a confirmation within several seconds, it's probably not particularly favorable. Maybe it's one of those like a prion um, confirmation, which is probably off to the side somewhere, right? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Could you simulate it? Maybe, but maybe yeah, you can simulate the molecule in, in its by itself, but it's interacting with it's really five complicated. other things. Yeah, yeah, right, right and right, right. it's complicated in a way that's really is favorable for current experimentation. Yeah, but smart people are out there; they'll figure it out, right? Well, I think it, it will be it, not in my lifetime. Well, it, 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 not in your lifetime, really. Uh, 
well, more will be learned, right? Right. But like, I mean, like, listen, we, like, we know you're just trying to be a winner and not die of the genetic disease. As long as you're, yeah. like, as far as you're concerned, like, then you've you've already. It's, it's a hard one. Um. Yeah. The um. And there was a and as someone's dropping into the chat. The uh, a molecular dynamic machine, specific machine that was developed called Anton. Um, developed actually. Do you know anything about this, Adam? This is David Shaw built this from oh, DE really? Shaw. No, I didn't. Uh, yeah, I didn't know about this one. Yeah, it, David Shaw like made it. It was one of the firms that basically invented high frequency trading, and oh, okay. yeah, a, and made a ton of money, and then spent it all on this like new computational approach for to advance molecular dynamics, which I thought was really interesting. Um, but it's really interesting that you say that this is going to be a hard that that it was almost depressing to learn that like this is probably true, and it means that this is going to be a hard area to study because it's just hard to get into. It's hard to like physically work with. I mean, it's hard to hard to come up with. I, so many of these experiments are so creative. I mean, it seems like so much of this is kind of coming up with the experiment to be able to go explore these domains that are unseen. Yeah, yeah no, it's it. I think a lot of biology really is a technology driven process like yeah our and, ability yeah. to assay things when that changes is a gold rush and right. all of a sudden people yeah, yeah. use the technology to explore their favorite project and we discover this cascade of new information yeah and he makes a point in there that i think was interesting which is like we're kind of always exploring the thing that we can explore yeah yeah and it's like of course i mean that, that that it sounds technological but it is also really important because it does mean that like as we improve technology and can explore a new domain it's going to open up the thing i felt obviously about the book i don't know love to know your take on it i felt like excited for biology like i can imagine that this book in the kind of the, in the right 17 or 18 year old would read this and be like oh this is like amazing i got tons of open problems here oh, oh yeah so absolutely cool. i mean inspiring right like if you inspiring. if you are kind of at the pre knocking on the door of biology to just know the 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 breadth of problems to be solved and also just like the the rate of innovation and like there are there's discoveries to be made right like it's it there's a potential gold rush and it just feels like it's a domain that's going to change or that i mean obviously has changed a lot because you're coming back to immunology being like all right so much for all that and i guess like so much has changed yeah. the last 15 years but it feels like a lot is going to change it feels very exciting yeah no absolutely it's a lot of open questions um Every organism does it a little bit differently. So, um, you know, if you, if you're, it depends on what you care about, right? If you want to study diversity of biology, it's, it's an infinite supply. Yeah. Um, That's, well, it's, it felt exhilarating to me to, to be, and, and to think about, um, that you have, there's so much information that's been preserved for so long and that allows the, the just the kind of life to do extraordinary that a lot of the versatility that life gets i mean it was kind of, kind of one of the interesting points to me that the, that you have some of this versatility that only comes out under duress or what have you yeah 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 i i, I remember there so I, I think you're citing this example in the book about um work done with heat shock protein yeah it was towards the end of the book and um, he talks about this woman, um, Susan Lindquist. I actually, um, I almost did my postdoctoral work with Susan Lindquist. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, she was amazing scientist. Unfortunately, she passed away a number of years ago, but um, she was absolutely fantastic. And actually, that paper was the paper that really got me interested in her lab. She also studied prions extensively. Oh, in interesting. The East. Yeah. And um, so the, the, the concept is really um, remarkable. And that is, you know, we accumulate mutations all the time. Most of them are bad. But then the idea was that maybe there is a built-in mutational buffer system. Yeah. Right? You can see how that will be selected for, right? Uh, and so, so there are these very weird proteins, which I don't know much about. They're called heat shock proteins because they, they are induced to have more of them in the cell when you heat the cell up or when you expose the cell to gas. That's why they're called heat shock proteins. They're, they basically they are kind of like the fire brigade, right? When things start to go wrong... That the cell ex experiences some extreme environment, these things get turned on. And um, they, they actually like, help proteins fold back into the, like, the probably the energy minimum. I'll be overstating the case a little bit, but they, they help get things, the, co the conformation of molecules get back to where they need to be 
during they, they, situations they, of heat. If they, if they get broken. Right, or, okay. Or, they're, they're, getting, they're getting denatured yeah, because yeah. of heat or whatever. And, and so the idea, right, is okay. that, the idea is that maybe there are mutations that would cause a protein to misfold, but that heat shock protein can fix that, right? And so um, it's a way that um, you can offer mutations, but also maybe that protein in their normal circumstances it works just fine. But when you stress the cell, the heat shock proteins can't quite keep up. So it allows that protein to uh, have a different function or break um, circumstantially under that new uh, under that new regime. And then maybe that can, is a way to um, have sort of get double dip, right? Right, interesting. You get the normal function of the protein, but you also get some altered function maybe when you need it, right? Huh. So very pr- provocative paper. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if the hypothesis is true or not. I have to follow the story. <laughs> yeah, right. It made a good. It made a good. It made a good read uh, when it came out. In the- yeah, that's that, that's really interesting. Um. Well, this has been uh, it's been great. I don't know if you got other other I, one thing I think people would be curious about is like other books you might recommend for folks that are interested in this. That I don't know if there are. Yeah. No. We talked about. Uh, what is life? By yeah, Erwin Schrödinger. I I I, I read that. And it, we have discussed extensively at the end of this book. Um, that that was really a, a foundational one. I did feel that there were a lot of like foundational biologists that I wanted to like learn more about, and then in the footnote they would explain like, oh, but also this person's a Nazi. Unfortunately, you're like, oh, okay, not be reading the, are... the, the 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 biography yeah. of Hilda Mangold anytime soon. I'm yeah. afraid the the the. I found the book a bit sanctimonious. It is so okay, all right, all right, forget it. Right, read the bio. All right, not not, not, not <laughs> right. Uh, I don't know. Um, so uh, other books. Um, uh, one that uh, a lot of biologists have read, I think, is called "The Microbe Hunters." Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely yeah. from one from the heroic age of of biology. It was probably written about a hundred years ago. I haven't read it in a long time, but to my recollection, there are parts that maybe haven't aged uh, as well as they could have. But um, I think captures the spirit of doing science at the bench uh, by candlelight and Bunsen burner light right, in the era before the light bulb. And, you know, like um, it, it was maybe getting into the kind of the, that, that yeah, early history it's atmosphere too. It's an atmosphere. It, it, all right. Well, that, it, that's a, a good recommendation. Well, this again, this is, I, I, to me, this has been great. I really appreciate you walking us through, you know, your, the, the domain. Um, I, the I, Adam, I don't know if you got any other thoughts here. Were you had any other thoughts from the book? This is a great recommendation, Brian, and definitely a stretch, but one I really enjoyed. So th- thanks for for pushing me and, and pushing a lot of the, the folks listening out. Yeah, and so I'm going to also share my notes in the chat, so um, so folks can see for whatever it's worth, like the things that the passages that I found that were interesting. Uh, Garav also has got a bunch of interesting notes and pointers to a bunch of other interesting things, um, and you know his uh, his take is, you know, he's got some uh, definitely some criticisms of the book or some things that 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 he felt that the the book uh, played down, what have you. Uh, but really felt that overall, this is like, he said, I was almost in tears by the end. Hard to describe how moving it is to see the fringe ideas that define my 20s put together in such a nice way for a broad audience. So um, there we go. I, the, bringing fringe ideas to the mainstream here, Greg. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it was, it was supper looking. I, and Brian, and I thank you again for the opportunity to be on here and to talk science. Yeah, that's hopefully, great. Hopefully not down to you, but uh, hopefully. Yeah, no, no, no. It's, 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 listen, we're talking about like eating brains around here and, you know, although <laughs> I'm, I'm not messing with those, yeah, the, 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 the frogs. Those I, frogs. I like, yeah. The, the, those frogs. Are, this is, and this is part of the reason why like, I'm ultimately a computer scientist. Like I don't want to deal with a hyper ovulating frog. I no, don't. You don't. Yeah. I just yeah. like that is, or, or unless they're delicious. <laughs> I don't know. It's <laughs> Uh, Adam, is like, Adam is like Adam. This is like the lab, the biology lab that you and I have. You're like, what do you mean you <laughs> ate all the frogs? And they're like, no, we, we uh, braised them. Yeah. They were, Here's the thing: I nope. ate the first one just for science, right? And for then science. so good. And then oh my god, that was good. Yeah, you know, my brother, a um, long time ago, he worked um, at a, a mouse facility doing in biology, in biology, right? To people doing experiments with mice, and 
oftentimes you're making a transgenic mouse. And um, so those, it's, it could be 50-50 whether it's inherited or not. Wait, 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 what does a transgenic mouse mean? Oh, you can add a gene to the mouse. Oh, got you. Okay, right? yeah, so yeah, sometimes right. that happens out of only one or two copies. And um, it's like for your experiment, let's say you want the mouse. When you breed the mice, that's like a one in four chance that a, the mouse will end up having both copies, right? Got so those are the ones you want to study, right? Probably, right? So he would take the ones that were the losers and he would actually feed them to his snake. <laughs> and and you know, their life had meaning instead of going into the uh, carbon dioxide bin. And the snake developed language. No, <laughs> and also no, is now a venture capitalist. Okay, oh, no, 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 <laughs> Someone in the chat is saying that is against a lot of protocols. <laughs> Probably, yes. You know, hey, listen, you go feed this snake then if you want to, like, Mr. Mr. Protocol, Mr. Abide by. It's also the non transgenic mice. It's fine. It's fine. Well, Greg, thank you again. Really, really appreciate it. Adam, thank you. Thanks everyone for, for joining us on this one. I thought this was fun. Um, we'll see when there's the. The next grassroots demand for another book club, Adam, and maybe never. So that's uh, right. Now that we've this, smoked the whole pack together. Yeah. We smoked the whole pack. We really did. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>